Carbon shoes are everywhere now. Every running shoe brand has their version and every runner has their race pair. But how much do you know about your carbon run shoes and are they worth their price tag? Today, we look at the truth behind carbon run shoes. Carbon shoes polarized the running world when they arrived on the scene. For some, they were an attack on the very purity of running. For many though, they were the natural and past due evolution in technology that running shoes needed. Technology, of course, improves every aspect of our lives, not just shoes and not just running. And so why should running shun new shoes that can help us all run further and faster? After all, the shoes we were already running in were allowing us to run further and faster than we were say in the 70s or 80s. Shunning this new technology would essentially mean that we should all just be running barefoot to keep the purity of running. But even if that logic was sound, the massive, almost seismic shift in the running world was hard to reconcile for many. Records that had stood for ages, decades even, were being broken almost weekly. And more importantly, running fields were divided into haves and have-nots. No matter your talent level, it was now impossible to compete with runners in carbon shoes if you didn't have them on. Those early shockwaves through the running world and the aftershocks too have now mostly subsided. Part of the issue was the yawning chasm between Nike and all the other brands, forcing most runners to run in Nike if they wanted to compete. But that gap is closed and most brands now have a carbon shoe. Adidas has reclaimed some of those world records from Nike as have ASICs. And most recently, On actually took a new run course record and an Ironman world title in their carbon run shoes. So has the carbon run shoe debate run its course, if you'll excuse the pun? Can you just buy any carbon run shoes and you'll be okay? Are the nearly $300 price tags for these carbon shoes worth it? Let's take a look at some of the truths you need to know about carbon run shoes. Our first point is, not all carbon shoes are created equal. New research from Austin State University has shown that despite hefty price tags and bold marketing claims, some carbon shoes offer little to no improvement whatsoever over their non-carbon alternatives. In a study, 12 runners tested seven different carbon shoes, the best according to marketing, and found that while some showed greater than 2.5% economy improvements, at least two of the seven carbon shoes showed no improvement whatsoever over a standard race shoe without carbon. Now, if you're itching to know which of these shoes are which, we'll leave a link down below to that study and you can read up, but don't go read it yet because there's still some truths coming up that you may want to hear. This seems obvious when you think about it. It's not as simple as just inserting a carbon plate into your midsole. That carbon plate has to be the perfect shape, has to interact perfectly with the foam around it, has to interact perfectly with your foot strike to give you an advantage over your standard good old running shoe. We spoke to Ons Jordan Donnelly from Ons Running Innovation Team. Although all carbon shoes might have the same three ingredients of a higher stack height, a super foam and a carbon plate, that does not mean that they're all made equally. The stack heights can be different, the composition of the foams can be different, the shape, the length, and the, um, the thickness of the plates can also be different as well. So although the three key ingredients which make a super shoe are pretty consistent, the makeup and the, the kind of the, the way you bake the cake uh, can be very different and give very different results uh, depending on the mixture of those ingredients. Which brings us to the next point. It's not the carbon plate, it's the foam. Although most of this uh, super shoes are called carbon shoes, it's actually the foam which is the biggest uh, difference maker. By having a higher stack height with a super foam, that's really reducing the impact on your body. So although we call it a carbon shoe, it's actually the foam which is uh, giving you the biggest benefit. That Austin study didn't look at the foam of the shoes they were comparing, but the author, Dustin Jaber, did say, It is evident from our data that simply including a carbon plate or increasing the stack height in a racing shoe does not confer equal improvements in economy. This would suggest that the foam and or interaction of the foam and the plate is crucial to the economy benefits. We didn't do any testing of the foam, but if we look at this lineup and what's different about these shoes, they all have carbon plates. They all have increased stack, but they have different foam. 
So if you buy the best carbon shoe with the best foam, you'll go faster, right? Possibly. The truth is, not everyone gets the same advantage. In a lab test at the University of Colorado, 18 runners were tested for their running economy. That is, how much energy was needed to run at a given pace. And when using the Nike Vapor Flies with carbon in them, versus the Nike Zoom Streak 6 or the Adidas Adios Boost 2, which don't have carbon in them, they saw an average improvement of 1.59% to 6.26% for the same shoes, hence Nike's 4% claim. This means that runners don't all get the same advantage from the same shoes. Some will get less than 2% advantage, while others get more than 6% advantage from the same shoes. Carbon shoes have responders and non-responders. This is because carbon shoes exert their performance improving effect by increasing energy return and decreasing the braking effect. And due to the biomechanics of some runners, they simply may not see any advantage whatsoever regardless of how well the carbon shoe is constructed or what it's constructed out of. We look at running economy, which is the how efficient um, the product is making you for your running when it comes to how much oxygen you need to use to run at a certain speed. And the shoe can definitely help with this, but to the extent at which it helps can differ depending on your running technique. In fact, it has been shown that these carbon shoes have the greatest effect on the least economical runners. If you have a low ground contact time, a low vertical oscillation and a high cadence, which are all positives for running economy, you will see less advantage than if you have a high ground contact time, high vertical oscillation and increased ground contact time. What we found out through different studies is that runners who can compress the foam more, load it up, get more back. This is what we call a high responder. This is another reason why there were calls for the ban of carbon shoes. They can give some advantage to runners that were previously back of the pack or back of the front pack at least, whereas they give no advantage to runners that were previous front runners. But that ship has sailed and carbon shoes are here to stay. And so if you want to run your best and compete with those people who are wearing them, you're going to need to get a pair for yourself. But if you are going to run in them, you should know carbon shoes may injure you. This is just standard common sense, really. Anything new should be implemented gradually and your body needs time to adapt to it. And if you don't give it enough time, you are going to risk injury. But normally this was reserved for old worn out shoes and not brand new shoes being blamed for injuries. When you take a new product, which is quite different to what you're used to, there's definitely an adaptation phase. The human body is great at adapting, but this takes a little bit of time. With the carbon plate, which is really kind of replacing the work at which your Achilles does, this can cause some, maybe some irritation with the adaptation. So we advise not to use the carbon shoe all of the time and phase it in to let your body really adapt to the use to get the biggest benefit. But the new shoes with their carbon plates and rocker shapes are such a drastic diversion from the old shoes that many underestimate the amount of adaptation needed to get used to them. And also, the long-term effects of using them. There's definitely a risk of wearing carbon shoes all of the time. The carbon plate acts um, to create stiffness in the forefoot, so you do not lose any energy when you flex the forefoot. However, this has an impact on the Achilles at the back of, of, your, of the shoe and at the back of your foot. The Achilles is really stabilizing your foot. However, placing a carbon plate from heel to toe can kind of do the work of the Achilles and almost weaken your foot over time. So it's very important that you do not wear carbon shoes all of the time. We advise maybe you use them for big workouts and save them for race day. But for easy runs and general everyday running, we would steer away from carbon shoes and use a product without a plate, which allows your foot to gain strength and train itself. Which brings us to our big truth bomb. You will not choose your best carbon shoe. So there was a study done, people might have read about it, by Stephen F. Austin University. And they, the study was around choosing the best product, depending on the runner. Most of the athletes actually chose the product, which was not giving them the best performance benefit. As Jordan says there in that study, almost all of the respondents chose the wrong shoe for them, not their fastest shoe. Only two of the 12 respondents chose the fastest shoe for their 5K time, 
and only three of the 12 chose the most economical shoe for them to run a marathon in. It is thought that all the respondents made their decision based mostly on mass, how heavy the shoe is. But these days with the carbon plates and responsive foam, your lightest shoe may not actually be your fastest anymore. So historically, before the era of super shoes, it was weight which was king. So the lightest shoe was the shoe which everybody wanted to have to feel light and fast. However, with the birth of super shoes, carbon plated shoes, weight is not everything. Although you do not want to be too heavy, there's definitely an advantage of having more material which you can compress, load up and really give you that energy return. The researchers actually concluded that for elite athletes to find the best shoe for their racing, they're going to have to do personal, laboratory-based running economy testing of various shoes. So if carbon shoes have changed anything, is that you can no longer go into a running shoe shop and walk out with the best shoe for you based purely on subjective feel. You're going to have to test multiple shoes to find out which one is best for you and at around 250 pounds a pair, that's not a very exciting prospect. Carbon shoes are here to stay and now you know the truth about them. So are you a responder or not? Did you try a whole bunch of carbon shoes before you chose the right one or did you just go for the most marketed hyped pair or did you just go for the one that felt the best? Let us know your experiences on carbon shoes in the comment section down below. We'd love to hear from you and remember hit the thumbs up button if you've enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching.